For our study today, you might like to have your Bibles opened up to Mark chapter 14. And as you're turning there, I'll simply remind you of something that you very well know. The time surrounding the crucifixion of Jesus is one of the darkest, if not the darkest, thing that we can imagine. Here was evil at paramount, seeking to undo this great plan that God had put into place. As Jesus went through this time, there were a number of things happening, including a number of trials. One of those trials was before the Jewish council, of which the chief priest was one of the main ones in attendance. As we look at this time that Jesus was before the current high priest, who was Caiaphas, people were coming forward and offering testimony that simply did not agree, yet they continued trying to find something in order to bring Jesus down to bring him to trial, and to get him before the Romans. As we look here in Mark chapter 14, you might like to go with me to verse 55. Here in verse 55 it says, Now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. In verse 60, we come to the time that the high priest in particular questions Jesus. Here we find one of the questions. Verse 60, the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? Now, on most occasions, the one who is under trial would be pleading for mercy, pleading for his life. But note the reaction of Jesus. Verse 61, he remained silent and made no answer. Caiaphas, however, did not give up. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? At this point, Jesus will give an answer. When asked to identify himself, verse 62, Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. At this point, we see Caiaphas becoming absolutely outraged. The high priest tore his garments and said, What further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? and they all condemned him as deserving death. As we look at this exchange, and as we see the reaction of Caiaphas, the question comes to mind is why did he react in this way? What was it about the answer of Jesus that outraged the high priest? In our study today, we want to answer that question. However, we have to understand that in answering that question, we must explore some things that came much, much earlier in the Bible story. As we begin our pursuit of this answer, we drop all the way back to the book of Genesis. In the storyline of Genesis, Abraham is an extremely important man. But one thing we understand is that he made a terrible mistake in bringing Lot, his nephew, along with him when God told him to leave his homeland and his family. Lot, more than once, proved to be a liability. One such occasion occurred when a group of kings were taken hostage by another group of kings, and Lot ended up being amongst those taken hostage. When Abraham heard of this, he took those of his household and went and rescued Lot. We find a very strange figure amongst this storyline. As the king of Sodom comes out and offers Abraham all manner of things, it's not really that king that stands out, but another who simply walks across the stage of the Bible without very much being said. That's Melchizedek. In looking in the book of Genesis, chapter 14, we find this describing the defeat that Abraham was able to accomplish on these kings who had taken the king of Sodom and others and Lot as hostage. And this is what we read beginning in verse 17. After his return from the defeat of Shedelamar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shavah, that is, the king's valley. Now here's where we're introduced to Melchizedek. 
And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him, talking about Abram here, he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Again, not much information we find out about Melchizedek, but two very important things. First of all, we find that he was the king of Salem. That's a word that means peace, and of course we recognize it from Jerusalem. So here in the early days, before we're introduced to the city, we're introduced to the region with their king, who the writer of Genesis also tells us was not only a king, but he was also a priest of God, a king priest, a royal priest is who we have here. And just like that, Melchizedek walks off the stage, and we do not read about him again until we come to the book of Psalms. Once again, somewhat rather strangely, at least on the surface it appears, we're again brought to, uh, to an introduction of this priest king. In Psalm 110, as David writes, he says this, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change His mind. And then here's our reference again. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, once again, we don't really get any background information. But here is this rather enigmatic king who makes his appearance in Genesis and once again makes his appearance in Psalm 110. Now, at this point, I want you to somewhat hit pause in your thoughts on the ideas of Melchizedek. We'll be back later. But for now, let's leave the Melchizedek of Genesis and the description here as brief as it is in Psalm 110 to the side, somewhat playing in the background. At this point, I want us to move into a bit of the history of Israel. And what we're going to find in the history of Israel is that there is a separation between the royalty and the priesthood. But let's get a little background information. As we move from Genesis into the book of Exodus, we're introduced to our next rebel on the scene. We've been following rebels ever since Genesis chapter 3, and as we move into the book of Exodus, it is none other than the king of the world empire of the day, that being Pharaoh of Egypt. We understand, both from the Bible and from secular history, that Pharaoh considered himself a royal priest, or we might describe as a priest king. Not only was he in charge of all of the governmental affairs, he was also in charge of Egypt's religion. That meant that he was the high priest of every pagan temple representing every single god in the land of Egypt. He could declare feast days, he could declare special rites, he could even declare religious wars in his job as being that high priest of the religion of Egypt. It was a powerful position, yet that power put Pharaoh in very grave danger. The pride that built up in his heart led him to make a statement like this, Who is Yahweh that I should listen to him? That was the reply of this priest king as Moses came in, directing Pharaoh in the name of Yahweh in the instructions of letting the people of Israel go. We find then a very strong ruler who gets himself into very great trouble because of his idea of all of this power and prestige that he thought he had. With that setting as somewhat of a contrast, we then find the Lord introducing how he wants his people Israel governed. After he pulls them out of this nation of Egypt, and he shows Pharaoh who the true king is and the true religious leader is, he leaves Egypt just simply in ruins, brings his people out, and transforms them into a nation. 
in that transformation as he's setting up the governorship of his land. He says this, I want the high priest to be the designated spiritual leader of this people. The high priest, not the king, would be the one who would lead the people in the way that they needed to go. Now, the book of Exodus is going to show us this to be a very important position. You can look in Exodus chapter 28, and here we find a rather lengthy section that is describing the garments of the high priest. There's a lot of symbolism in that, and it may be that after this study, you'd like to review over that and just see it. But for now, we'll simply say that when you saw the high priest coming in all of his regalia, you knew that there was something special about it. You knew that he was not just some common man. Following that description of the high priest garments, as well as the other priest garments, we come to chapter 29, where the high priest and the other priest will be recognized because of their consecration. Again, a lot of detail given here. But one of the things that we find is that the priest will be an anointed position. In other words, as a part of this consecration, you would be anointed with oil. So for the high priest, it would not be strange at all to refer to him as the anointed. It would recognize part of that consecrating efforts that went to separate and to designate him as the spiritual leader. Perhaps, though, what stood out the most about the high priest was the fact that he represented God. That was abundantly clear one time a year on the Day of Atonement, where the high priest passed from the court area of the tabernacle, where many people could go, to the, to the holy place, where only a few people could go, on into the most holy place where only the high priest could go. The most holy place represented the throne room of God, complete with the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat sitting on it, with the cherubim present. Here it represented where God met with mankind. The high priest represented God in walking through the court, through the holy place, into the most holy place where he would make atonement for the people of God. Thus, if Israel had been paying attention, they knew that there was something very special about this position and something very special about what this position represented. A little bit later in the Torah, when we come to the book of Deuteronomy, we find that God also made provisions for a king. This king was to be a spiritually minded man. There is no doubt about that. But what we do find is that he was not in charge of religion. Whereas Pharaoh was considered to be the king priest, the high priest of every religion, that was not the case in the worship of Israel to Yahweh. We see that in the instructions that the king is given. Let's note what's said in Deuteronomy chapter 17. It says, And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priest, and it shall be there with it. And he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of the law and these statutes and doing them. Here we find he's to be a spiritually minded man, a copy of the law beside him that he wrote and that he reads every day and that he uses not only to make himself right with God, but also in his governance of the people of God. Yet I want you to note something in this passage. This copy of the law must be approved by the Levitical priest. Again, we're seeing the separation. We're seeing that while the king is spiritual, the priesthood... In particular, the high priest is the one responsible for the spiritual health of the nation of Israel. And there we find this separation taking place in very clear terms as we look in the Torah with the instructions both to the high priest and to the king, who, by the way, is also anointed. Thus we find the high priest and the priesthood being anointed and the king being anointed. 
Did the nation of Israel understand all of this? Did they understand it and get it right? Well, unfortunately, as we read their history, we find some rather dramatic times where they fail to recognize this. One of those comes many years later after the time that we're reading, on into the time of the divided kingdom. There was a king by the name of Uzziah who was a very righteous man. In fact, much of what we're told about Uzziah is, is told in glowing terms. We're told about how spiritually minded he was and how he uh, would go after God and he would seek the Lord's counsel and the Lord blessed him with peace and prosperity. And if we could end the story there, we would find in Uzziah a king very much like David. But that's not where the story ends. In him, we find a king who crossed this line of separation. Let's read a little bit about this from 2 Chronicles 26. Speaking of Uzziah, it said, But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. For he was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now let's stop there for a minute. What are we seeing? Here was a man who had been richly blessed. Here was a man who had been given peace. Here was a man who understood the blessings of the king who follows God. Yet he allowed that to begin to think better of himself than he should have. And so the writer tells us that he grew strong and that it was to his detriment, to his destruction. And so what does the king choose to do? The king chooses to try to merge the kingship and the priesthood. This, in a sense, is a reminiscence of what was going on with Pharaoh. Here was a king who said, I am going to be the religious leader. The writer doesn't tell us why he thought this. Maybe he had misunderstood passages from the Torah. Maybe he misunderstood passages from Genesis. And in his mind, he thought, since I have been righteous and God has blessed me, I am going to be this royal priest. I'm going to be this priest king. The true priest, however, knew better. And so Azariah, who's ministering in the temple, says to the king, along with 80 priests who were with him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priest, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring no honor from the Lord God. Azariah knew exactly what needed to happen. He says, you are not the priest king, and what you're doing is you are treading in an area that is reserved only for the priesthood. And he says, you had better get out because the anger of the Lord is going to be stirred up against you. Unfortunately, the pride that was in Uzziah's heart would not subside. And we read, Uzziah was angry. Now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And when he became angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priest in the house of the Lord by the altar of incense. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they rushed him out quickly, and he himself hurried to go out because the Lord had struck him. Uzziah had decided that as king, he was going to offer the incense, the job that was reserved for the priesthood. I don't know if we need to make this point or not, but if we return to the book of Exodus, we find that after the description of the high priest's clothing and after the description of the consecration, the first thing we read about is the altar of incense. Could it be that Uzziah had been in those passages. And in assuming his role as a priest king, he says, this is what I'm going to do. God didn't choose to tell us whether that's the case or not. What he did choose to do, however, is to illustrate fully his displeasure at a king who had crossed the line. And so with leprosy, the priests react hurriedly, they push him out, but it was an easy job because Uzziah knew he had crossed the line. He leaves and the king then was a leper from that day to the day of his death. 
and being a leper, lived in a separate house and was excluded from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's household governing the people of the land. Because he crossed the line, Uzziah not only was not able to go into the temple of God, he also, in a sense, left his own, left his own kingly position, his own kingly house. He lost that and had to live alone with his son serving as prime minister in his stead. That's what happens when a king crosses the line. But let's also realize that it wasn't the king alone. We find also that there were a series of high priests who demonstrated their failure to honor this anointed position. We can think even of Aaron, the first high priest, who made the decision to build a golden calf going always, all the way to the time of Caiaphas, who by the time he became chief priest, was simply serving in a bought and paid for position. Both the kings at times and the high priest at times failed to recognize this separation and this distinction that God had made. But let's move into the time of Jesus. When Jesus comes to the earth, we're going to find that things begin to change rather rapidly. And as Jesus went throughout His ministry, a number of the things that He said very much upset the religious elite. We're not going to try to go through them all. But let me give you just a couple of examples. One of those is at the inauguration of His ministry. As He opens the scroll of Isaiah and He reads this, He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What's going on here? As Jesus reads from this, He is saying to these people, I am the one who the prophet prophesied about. And note that he chose a passage that talked about anointing. He talked about a passage of proclaiming spiritual things. And even if we look at the end of this, of the proclamation of the year of the Lord's favor, that draws us back to that 50th year of Jubilee, where we find debts are freed and land is returned. Everything about this passage is speaking of priestly things. And Jesus says, the one who's reading this is the one who has fulfilled it. And we know that the people wanted to kill Him at that point. They, they tried to take Him and throw Him off a cliff because they understood that He was saying things about Himself that they were very uncomfortable with Him saying. Let's look at another here in the book of Luke. Going over to Luke chapter 5. This is one of the favorite miracles of most everybody. Where a paralytic man is brought in by his friends, they can't get him through the, the door of the house, and so they break a hole in the roof and they lower him down. And so Jesus is kind of watching this man come down in front of him. And it says that when he saw their faith, these men up on the roof, who had lowered their friend down. He turns to the man and he says, your sins are forgiven. That is not what anybody was expecting, including these men and including this man who was paralyzed. But for sure, it was not what the scribes and Pharisees were expecting. They are watching, they're listening, they're trying to get a grasp of who this Jesus is. And so they're thinking in their hearts, who is this who speaks blasphemies? And note their statement. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus perceives that and He says, why are you questioning? I, I think the implication is, why don't you just ask me about this? But I want you to note what, the, what these men, scribes and Pharisees, would be thinking. Jesus is speaking in priestly terms. Who was in charge of helping someone to get forgiveness of sins? It was the priest. But the priest didn't offer that forgiveness. They simply were facilitators in helping one gain forgiveness from God. And so, not only was Jesus taking on a very priestly role, He was going far beyond that. 
He was taking on the role of God Himself. And that's what they recognize. And that's what they don't like about His words. Let's come back now to where we began. When we look at this exchange with Caiaphas, what is it that's going to outrage Caiaphas so much about what's going on? Look at the statement once again from Mark chapter 14. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Now here's the question we want to focus on. The high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And here is Jesus' reply. I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. There is certainly a reference in here to the book of Daniel, but there's a bigger reference than that. Here we find Jesus answering this question from Psalm 110. His language draws us back to this psalm of David that we read earlier in the lesson. And you'll recall that the point David works to is this one who is coming, this one who is going to be the Messiah, is going to come in the manner of the Melchizedekian priesthood, in the likeness of Melchizedek. So then, The high priest knew exactly what Jesus was claiming. The high priest would have recognized the prophecy and was himself looking for this one who would be the royal priest. And what he has just heard is Jesus claimed that position for himself. Jesus says, I am the priest king. I am the royal priest. And thus we have the shadow and the substance, face to face. Here we have the high priesthood that represented God now in front of the high priest, God Himself. And rather than tearing His garments in anger, Caiaphas should have fallen at the feet of Jesus and worshipped this One who after long centuries of prophecy had now come to introduce the grand jubilee, to introduce what the anointed can do in releasing from sin. But instead, he considered him a blasphemer and worked to instigate his death. And we know that happened. But what is so interesting is that even up to the very end, Jesus is still being that high priest as He looks down on this crowd and He says, Father, forgive them. As a priest, He was making intercession. As God, He's forgiving. That's what outraged Caiaphas. But what outraged Caiaphas should bring absolute joy to our heart. Because as we think about this royal priest... We understand that He is our King. He is our royal priest. And the writer of Hebrews wants to make sure we get that point. In his book, we find Melchizedek brought back to the forefront. His brief mention in Genesis, his brief mention in Psalms, now we're beginning to see a great deal about him. And as we look in chapter 5, verses 5 through 10, we read, So also Christ did not exalt Himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by Him who said to Him, You are My Son. Today I have begotten you. As He says also in another place, quoting here from Psalm 110, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of His flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears, to Him who was able to save Him from death. And He was heard because of His reverence. Although He was a son, He learned obedience through what He suffered. And being made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation 
to all who obey Him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. The writer of Hebrews writes to us and he says, I want you to understand this clearly. This Jesus is your royal priest. He is the one represented by Melchizedek. He is the priest not of Levi but a priest from the tribe of Judah. So in that sense, as Melchizedek had no genealogy to make him a priest, neither did Jesus. He was appointed to that position by the Father Himself. We find also in chapter 7, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men to their weakness as high priests. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Here is Jesus, our high priest, Not after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. What does that then mean? Well, that means as the Levitical priesthood represented God, the high priest representing God on that day of atonement, Jesus is God. And as we see the Levitical priesthood uh, made up of people who sinned, and this is the point being made by the writer of Hebrews, They had to offer sacrifices for themselves to get rid of their own sins before they could offer them for the people. Jesus offers Himself up as the perfect sacrifice. There is no sin within Him. He is not a man. He is not a human who has fallen to sin. He is God. He is perfect. And as the Levitical priest offered continual sacrifices, Jesus offered only one. There's no reason for you and I to offer up these animal sacrifices today because our high priest offered himself as the Lamb of God to take care of our sins. Here is the better priesthood, the writer of Hebrews would tell us. Here is that one who is now the royal priest, the priest king, the anointed, who offers himself for us. And what is so amazing about all of this is that He has now provided access to the throne. That's what the writer of Hebrews tells us. He says, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted, as we are, yet without sin, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. We might be very timid about this priest, this high priest. And we might say, well, I'm a little more comfortable with those human high priests because they know what I'm going through. They've sinned like me. They know what it is. And so the writer of Hebrews assures us we have the better high priest because he's one who has been tempted in every regard as we are tempted, yet he was perfect. He didn't sin. Notice how that makes him better. He knows what we go through and he knows what it takes not to fall prey to sin. And in knowing us so well, He throws open the doors to the throne room and He says, through me, don't approach with timidity. Don't approach with fear. You approach this throne with confidence that I have done everything so that you can find grace when you are in need. That is an amazing thought. And one more amazing thought is that through this royal priest, He's prepared the way for our consecration. The Apostle Peter certainly picks up on this idea 
And he says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. And we just found out how. But I want you to note how that Peter picks up this Old Testament language and he brings it and he says to you and to me, you are a royal priesthood. And as a royal priest, you are to proclaim the excellencies of this one, this high priest who offered himself so that we could become like him. That's the high priest we serve. And all those many years ago, as Melchizedek made his brief appearance on the stage, God has been working this plan, slowly giving us details to say, throughout the history of this nation, I know what can happen to people. And I am not going to put any man under the temptation of letting him be both the high priest and the king. But one day, one will come. This one that David prophesied about in Psalm 110 would be that substance of the shadow Melchizedek. And then as we come to the New Testament, we watch everything unfold as Jesus Christ assumes that position. And as we think about all of these grand thoughts, I hope that every one of us can humbly accept what Caiaphas boldly rejected. And that's Jesus Christ as our priest king. If you're ready to approach that throne of confidence, this high priest offered himself as a sacrifice for you. That's how much he loves you. And simply what he says to do is to recognize him as your king, as your priest to give yourself to Him in the waters of baptism, to allow your sins by the grace of God to be washed away, to be raised new and whole. A royal priest, ready to do the work of your royal King. If I can help you with that, you let me know. Or if you're at a point in your life where you knew all of this, but it somewhat faded and you're ready to revive that faith, let me know that as well. And we will work to make salvation happen today for you through this wonderful gift of our High Priest, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining in this study today.